All right. Are you ready to jump back into the Word this morning? Good to be with you. Good to be with all of those who are online. Thank you for taking precautions. Thank you for uh, having social distances. Thank you for all of those things. We continue to trust that God will continue to uh, work in our hearts and in our world. So this Christmas season, we have been focusing on the various names and titles given to us primarily in the book of Isaiah. Two weeks ago, we talked about the term Emmanuel, which means God with us, circumstances. Last week, we focused on the title of Wonderful Counselor. This is the God who knows counsel. Will we not reach to him, long for him, look for him, and he will guide us and lead us. He indeed is the Wonderful Counselor. And these titles were given to us in the sovereign birth announcement 800 years or so before this child was to show up. And this first announcement, and there was war, and there was darkness, and there was anxiety, and there was stress. And God told them this in Isaiah chapter 9, starting with verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death a light has dawned and there was recognition of the two realities that were taking place and it's a recognition of their realities and it's a recognition of our reality because we do have circumstantial darkness in which we don't know what is beyond the next calendar day. We don't know what's beyond the next door. We don't know what's beyond what we're going to face even this day. And there is uncertainty and there's darkness and there's anxiety and there's all of these things. And into that circumstance, a light has dawned. And then going beyond that, in that hope, there is a pointing to the eternal, eternal darkness, right? All of us are living, sound familiar, familiar, in the valley of the shadow of death, right? This imagery is picked up all over the Psalms and into the New Testament, that we have a uh, circumstantial difficulties at times where it's hard to see, and in that darkness, a light has dawned. And then we have an eternal darkness, knowing that now we're living in the shadow of death. But we are to fear no evil. Why? Because you are with us. Unto us a son has been given. An S-O-N, literally, a flesh and blood incarnation. And into our darkness, the son, S-U-N, has risen to give us light. This was the promise that was given thousands, well hundreds, well thousands of years ago by God our Father announcing to his people that a light there is hope, a light there is clarity, a light there is salvation. And he goes on in Isaiah chapter 9, and we're going over this time and time again, and his name shall be called. Let me tell you about his name. Let me tell you about this son. Let me tell you about this light. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. His name shall be called Mighty God. He is the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There is and will be no one like this son that is given. No one else can carry these titles. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And so it is beneficial for us to focus in on these titles and what it says about this son, but what it means for us as his children. 
And so it should be curious to us when you read this, in particular, the title we're focusing in on today. Everlasting Father. So we have to ask the question, how can a son that's being given be the everlasting Father? Have you ever thought about this? Wait a second. A son is given who is the everlasting Father. So how does that work? And I'm going to tell you it works this way. That Jesus, in this sense, is the everlasting Father. Father, because he is the source of everything, and he is the life of all his people, okay? A father being there, everlasting, being eternal, being the source of everything that was created and the source of life. Now, the apostle John picks up this exact language and these exact thoughts of an eternal father, of a son being given, who's become and is the light of the world. Go, if you would, to John chapter 1. We're going to look at these verses, and then we're going to look primarily at another passage as we focus in on the concept of Christ being the everlasting father. But notice what John says to us here. This is the beginning of the gospel of John. In the beginning, in the very beginning, right, of everything that was created was the Word That is Christ, always eternally existent. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now, all things were made through Him. You catch this sense of origin. And without him was not anything made that was made. Everything that came into existence came through the Word, which is the Son who is eternal, who is God and with God. In him was life. And the life was the light. Are you catching this? The light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not and will not and cannot overcome him. If there's ever a battle between darkness and light, guess who wins? Light every time. I've never seen a candle that is burning in a dark room all of a sudden go out because the darkness was too much for it, right? Doesn't happen that way. And there is a darkness that presses against and is scared of the light and wants to envelop us in fear, envelop us in sin, envelop us in condemnation. But into our temporal circumstances and into our eternal deficit, a sun has been giving. A light has come. And the darkness will never overcome him. Now do you see this connection in John's opening statement talking about an eternal one, an everlasting Father, bringing life, bringing everything that is made, and being the light of the world. So this Son is the source of all things. He is eternal, making Him, in this sense, a Father of everything, even though He is the Son to God the Father. This is Christ the Lord. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. He sustains all things by His powerful Word. And if you have seen Jesus, you have seen the Father. Jesus was explaining this to one of His disciples. His name was Philip, and this is recorded in John chapter 15, starting with verse 6. They're having a conversation, and here are these words that hopefully we memorize. That says, Jesus said to Philip, he says, 
I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. Now, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you have known me, you would have known my Father also. Here is this connection between the Son and the Father and the Father and the Son. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So if we look to God the Son, we see God the Father. Now in verse 8, it goes on. It says, Philip said to Jesus, he said, Well, Lord, show us the Father. That'll be enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long? You still don't know me? Philip, isn't that sad where people can be around Christ and not yet know him? That took place then and it takes place now. And God, help us to see who he is. Jesus goes on and says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. So this everlasting Son, or this Son that is giving, really is everlasting, is the everlasting Father, mighty God, wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace. All of these things are his title because he is all of these and so much more. Jesus came to show us being a physical representation of God who lives in an inapproachable light. This light came into our darkness. One of the primary things that Jesus came to do was to reveal the Father to us. Now, the Father's image has been marred and perverted, even to this day where people have multi-understandings of a singular triune God. We have come to think God is either, I don't know, um, a spirit and just an essence or a force. Some see that God does not exist. Some see God as different. Um, If you've been to India, there's all types, right? And they see all of these philosophies and all of these concepts about God. The image of God has been attacked and marked right from the beginning. You know the number one attack of Satan in the Garden of Eden? Guess what it was? Did God really say, you remember this, Genesis chapter 3? Eve, Adam, can you trust this God? God is holding out on you. He doesn't want you to become like him because he is what? Scared of you or he's a killjoy or he doesn't really like you. The attacks, the primary attack of Satan is not against you. It's against God the Father. And he has tried to twist his image. And even our earthly fathers. Anyone here have a perfect earthly father? The answer to that is zero, right? And it was read that even on our best days as as men who long and, and look to be like Christ, even on our best days, we're a hazy image of the eternal father. And often people have a hard time calling God their father because they're viewing them, viewing him through the lens of their earthly father. So if their earthly father was abusive, or abandoned them, or was distant, or was angry, or was liberal, or was legalistic, often we view God through the same lens. Is that not true? Okay. And so what I want to encourage you now is to view the Father through the lens of Jesus, right? And then view our fathers through the earthly fathers, through the eternal lens of what God shows himself to be in Scripture by his Spirit through his Son. So it's important to us to understand God 
our Father, this eternal Father. Because if we get God right, everything else comes into place. But if we get Him wrong, everything else falls apart from our identity to the source of everything that is made, to our interactions to one another, to what eternity is like. People have a lot of unbiblical concepts of God and Christ. Even people in the church. So when you read Scripture, and again, I would encourage you to read Scripture, and we're going to look at a very famous passage this morning. When you read it, I want you to ask yourself and understand, what is God saying here? What does it reveal about who He is? And when you read the Scripture, and the Scripture reads you, our understanding becomes closer and fuller and deeper and richer as to who God is. The Father is the everlasting Father reflected and seen in the face of His Son. The primary place that we're going to be looking, looking at this morning is Luke chapter 15. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn open to that. Luke chapter 15. Thanks again for all of our crew working our cameras, working the sound, making this available to connect with our greater community. Thank you for that work. Luke chapter 15. Now, most of us, if not all of us, are very, very familiar with this chapter. This is a chapter in which Jesus was having a conversation with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders, were not understanding the heart of God. They had the stuff of the kingdom, but they lacked the heart of the king. Okay? And so Jesus was explaining to them as they were criticizing Christ for spending time with sinners, spending time with those outside of the walls of the safe, secure kingdom. They're like, why are you spending time with those people, right? God help us for having that understanding in our own heart. And I encourage you to examine your own heart. And so they criticized Jesus. So Jesus, in response, told three stories. One about a lost sheep, and we like that one, right? Where there's a shepherd, and the sheep was lost, and he went out to find the sheep. And the last line of that, and this is Luke chapter 15, there was great rejoicing to a sinner who repents. Second is a story of a lady who had some coins, but she lost one of them. And in her house, there was a latch or a wood floor, and she sought, and she looked, and she swept, and she labored until she could find this coin. And once it was found, there was rejoicing. And not to miss the point, Jesus says that there's great rejoicing when a sinner repents. And then lastly, he tells the story of the prodigal son. And he connects all of these, and as he was going, he was building one upon another upon another. One revealing the heart of God, and two also revealing our own hearts. And so we're going to look at this story of the prodigal son and focus in on the characteristics of the father. And this is the first primary point from this parable, the one that I'm bringing forward. Number one, the father releases... Those who are running. So let's read this. This is Luke chapter 15, starting with verse 11. And Jesus said, There's a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. So we have a, a setting, father to sons. Now this father had some property, right? He had some possessions. And the younger of the two sons didn't want to be with his father any longer. So he says, Dad, give me my stuff, please. And I don't know if it was a please, I think it was more of a demand. So we have to ask ourselves, well, what is going on here? Because this father divided his property among these two kids. Now, if I was that father, and if I understood the heart of my boys, I probably wouldn't have given him the stuff. I would have said, yeah, I know what you're going to do with that stuff. Uh-uh. 
What you're telling me is basically you don't want to have anything to do with me and you would rather that I was dead. Because the time in which the sons got the stuff of their father was when the father passed on and the son was saying, emboldened, saying, give me my stuff now. So he's saying that he wanted to be away from the father. And the father gave him the stuff. And I use these words intentionally. The father releases those who are running. Now it says in James chapter 4 that we do not have because we do not ask. Okay, you know this. And so the son was asking, but then it goes on and says, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. So that you would, what, what you receive, that you would spend on your own selfish pleasures. And so in that sense, is not, this is not happening here. What's happening here is not a James chapter 4 concept of someone asking, okay? What's happening here is a Romans chapter 1 concept where the Father turns people over to what they desire more than Him, okay? No one wants to be with someone who doesn't want to be with them. We can say amen to that. It's like having a sliver, right? It's there with you, but no one's having a good time, right? And if it's not removed, it's going to fester, right? I've been on trips with people who don't want to be there. It's miserable, right? And God is not after what we can give Him. God is after our heart, right? And He knew That the younger sons, and perhaps even the older sons, heart wasn't with him. And that he would rather have his freedom, and he would rather have his own ability to do what he wants, with who he wants, whenever he wants. So God the Father, in his wisdom, in his love, turned him over to what he most Wanted. I don't know about you, but at times in which, and there has been times in my own life that I've just had to turn people over to what they really want. And I didn't do it because I was excited about it. And you still gave, and as a father, you still give. And we, we, we raised a young girl, by the way, who, who we had to have this conversation, and she went her own way. It wasn't our daughters. It was another girl that we had come and live with us. We raised her for uh, many, many years. And so we give as parents, but there comes a time in which we know that their heart is not connected to us. And so the most loving and generous and wise and severe thing we could do is just to turn them over to what they most desire. Again, go to Romans 1, chapter, excuse me, verses 18 and beyond. You'll see this. Turn them over, turn them over, turn them over, turn them over. So God releases those who are running. Releases those who are running. And the hopes that there would be a returning. Interesting to note that our Father does not force anyone into relationship with Him. He invites us. He shows us His goodness. He continues to be consistent in His character. But if people do not want to be in relationship with Him, then He turns us, them, over to what we want more than Him. So he divided up his property. Now, it continues in verse 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had. Right? Got his stuff. The father releases those who were running. And he took a journey into a far country. He wasn't just going for the town over that dad might hear what's going on. No, no. He got as far away as he could. Right? And there at that point, he squandered his property in reckless 
living, doing what he wanted to do, with whom he wanted to do, however he wanted to do it. And he came to the end of himself. And when he had spent everything, external circumstances came in, and God can use them. A severe famine arose in that country. And this young man began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He was not now living on what was given to him. He ran out of those things. He was desperate. External circumstances were coming against him. And so he realized in order to survive, I have to go get a job. He found a job and it wasn't a glamorous one at all. Who sent him to the field to feed pigs. Verse 16, and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. If we want something more than God, then God turns us over to it. It says if you want to be in relationship with that more than you want to be in relationship with me, then you can do that. But let me tell you, in the end, it will not be good for you. And so he allows us to run our course, not because he's cruel, but because he's compassionate. And external circumstances come in, and it gets difficult in the world often. And in its heart, it is cruel. And compassion less and heart less uses us and goes get something else and uses that. This is the nature of our fallen humanity. Sometimes the most loving thing we can do is to turn people over to what they most desire in order that they would come to the end of themselves. And it is a hard, painful process. And we'll see the Father's response to all of this. And so this young man, he came to himself. That's the wordage here in Luke chapter 15, verse 17. But when he came to himself, this was the aha moment. This was a wake-up call. This was a realization of what he had done and who he had become. And then he thought about his life and he thought about his father. And he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I'm going to die here with hunger. You know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to go back to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Sometimes the crushing weight of the world will bring people to the end of themselves. Notice that the Father released those who were running, right? But he left them there. He didn't go and search for them. You notice this? Okay. Why? Because in doing, he still wouldn't have had his heart. He may have had his physical presence, but he wouldn't have had his spirit. So he had to let the son go, as God does also to his sons and daughters. And this young man came to himself. And this was a true repentance. This was true humility. He wasn't going back to his dad to say, look at what you made me do. He wasn't returning to his father to try to get a little bit more so he can go back to the casino and the brothel or wherever. He wasn't doing that. There's a difference. He recognized that he had, number one, sinned against God. Ultimately, all sin is against God because God is the perfect one. We sin ultimately against God firstly, and it's seen secondarily in our relationships of corruption with one another. I've sinned against God. I have done so before you, my Father. 
no longer to even be in relationship with you, even though I am your flesh and blood, I, I'm no longer worthy of this. This was true humility, true repentance. Can I just come back and work around here? The Father releases those who are running, but the Father also runs to those who are returning. Catch that. This is Luke chapter 15 as Jesus continues to reveal the heart of his Father, to reveal his own heart. He said this, and he arose, this young man, and came to his Father. <clears throat> but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. I want you to have a good understanding of God the Father. He is the source of everything. And Jesus' heart is the same way. And these people who are around him, the Pharisees in particular, some religious people, they had the stuff of the kingdom, but they lacked the heart of the king. He said, I'm not happy about this. I'll give to you, but if you want that, then I'll give it to you. But he wasn't sitting up on his throne indignant for the ungrateful. No. He was waiting for the return. And knowing that there had been a ch change of heart, and then once he saw it at a distance, he knew that the sun was coming back. He didn't just sit there and say, well, about time, you're ungrateful, no good. Right? Wasn't that way at all. He had compassion and knew that the work had been done, his heart had been changed, and now he's returning, and he ran in his direction. Isn't that a beautiful image? God! Christ running! Why? Compassion. He didn't want the separation to go on any longer. He didn't want the pain to go on any longer. He didn't want the distance to be any greater. And he looked as there was a turn of heart and a turn of direction the Father saw and ran. Right? It's a beautiful God, help us to know that that's God's heart and help us to have his heart and to turn, to run, and to embrace. And I love this. The Father embraces those who are repentant. Okay. Notice there's a qualifier there. Did he still love his son that when he was distanced, when he was rebellious, when he was away from him? Yes, but there was not this closeness and connectivity and relationship. And compassion was shown when there was a change of heart and there was a return and repentance. God just not stiff arm, but there was an embracing of this one, a running to, and a reconnection. That's God's Heart. And the son said to him as they connected, he says, Father, I've sinned. I've broken our relationship. I've rebelled against you. I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father, he said to his servants, Hey, Bring quick the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, put shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. He heard this confession after this embracing of the repented, and he says, this is how I am, and then the son says, now let me restore you, right? Here is a, a robe to cover your filth and your unrighteousness. Here is some dignity. Here is a ring on your finger returning authority. Here is shoes for your feet signifying freedom. I'm giving these again back to you. I'm so glad you are back. And he embraces those who are repentant. Do you, do I, do we do the same thing? Right? Perhaps you identify 
with trying to be like and hopefully we all like our everlasting Father and have his characteristics and understand his heart, knowing that he wants us, not what we can give to him. And that in wisdom and in freedom and in grace, we allow people to go their own way and in compassion we run and there's repenting and there's a embrace, an embrace and there's a restoration not, well, you better sit at the kids' table in the other room until I'm not mad with you anymore. Right? Not that. Immediately, quickly, let's restore this one. Let's embrace the one who is repentant. Now again, sometimes people return, not in repentance, but in still rebellion. And you have to discern what's going on. But our heart should be like Christ, who embraces and celebrates. This is the last thing. The Father celebrates those who are restored. Let's celebrate. Let's gather people around. This deserves some recognition. This deserves some um, uh, what's, the, what's the word? Spending some money, okay? Killing the fatted a sacrifice. That's the word I'm looking at. It deserves sacrifice. It deserves recognition that this thing is huge. He says, for my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to celebrate. Don't you love that? Right? God celebrates those who have spent time running away from them, that return to him, he celebrates and says, this is my son, this is my... God help us not to have the stuff of the kingdom, the kingdom. Where are the, you on those who are outside the fence? Where is your heart towards them? I hope they just curl up and die. If you think that... You don't have the heart of the Father. That was a strong statement. Yeah, it was. Okay. If you're wishing that someone would just die, that's not Christ. The gospel is for them. And there is a post log to this story. If you continue to read, there's this interaction with the oldest son understanding of his position stood up and refused to celebrate. And embrace and acknowledge the goodness of his father. This son who was on the inside, remained on the inside, had all the stuff of the kingdom, didn't understand the heart of the king. Right? So we have to ask God where there's uncertainty and there's anxiety and there's fear and there's failure and there's rumors and there's so much swirling around in that darkness. A light has come. A son has been given. And his name is Emmanuel, God with us, full of grace and truth. And his name is Wonderful Counselor. And his name is Mighty God. And his name is Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Let us have the heart of the Father seen in the face of of the Son, let us embrace those who are returning. Let us give God the praise for His source and who He is. Jesus is the Son that was given, who is the everlasting Father. Behold Him. Embrace Him. Receive Him. Reflect Him. We are given in Christ. What we're given in Christ is beyond our comprehension. Into the darkness, into our darkness, the light has come. The darkness will not overcome it. Are you grateful for that? Right? 
the darkness in the world and the darkness in the valley of the shadow of death will not win. The sun will win. The light has come and the darkness will not overcome him. And so we wait in the shadow, shining a light, reflecting his glory that we, because he is the light of the world, we reflect that light. So let us be people of hope these days. Come on. Right? Let us be people of compassion these days. Compassion. Let us be people of grace. Let us be people who celebrate what is good and right and true. Let his Holy Spirit work in us so that we in turn will reflect him in the darkness of our world, pointing to the true light who will bring life to all people. Know God, behold him. Embrace this son who is given. Receive him, reflect him. A walk according to his way. So God, here we are, your people, gathered around your word God, in different physical places around this city, around this country, around the world. And God, we are beholding you this morning, <laughs> this son who was given. Into the darkness, a light has come. God, thank you for inviting us to be a part of your family. God, help us to have the heart of the king who has compassion for his children. And God, we pray that you would do a work in our hearts, be it the, we're the first son, be it we're the second son, that all of us can re reflect the Son, which is Christ. We pray for the prodigals that they would come home, that the pressures of this world will crush them until they come to the end of themselves, so they turn to the source of eternal life, which is you. Help us, God, to have compassion Help us to know the heart of the Father, this everlasting Father. Help us reflect this everywhere we go. And God, we need your help. I need your help. Thank you for coming into our darkness. Thank you for not leaving us alone. Thank you for always giving us hope. We trust in you this day. In Jesus' name, amen.